Hello, I'm Daria Hibo with the William J. Hughes Center for Public Policy at Stockton University, and today we'll be talking to three Stockton professors about state-sponsored violence in Belarus. Can you please introduce yourselves? Uh, my name is Lauren Belasco, and I'm an assistant professor of political science, and I teach comparative politics. Hi, I'm Tina Zapilli, and I am an associate professor of political science, and I am in the area of international relations and international political economy. Hello, my name is Mariana Smith, and I'm assistant professor and I teach in visual arts, but I also work with the issues of globalization and migration. Thank you. We are very fortunate to have you on the panel. We're going to be discussing the current situation in Belarus as the country experiences massive and unprecedented historic upheaval against an authoritarian regime following the August 9th presidential election. The president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, who has ruled for 26 years and is often described as Europe's last dictator, was declared the winner of the election. Ever since, the country has seen protests of tens of thousands of participants, and on Sunday, September 6, more than 100,000 people marched on the president's residence, calling on him to quit. The demonstrations were met with violence from the government, which included the police spraying tear gas, beating and shooting the protesters, and making thousands of arrests. I was born and raised in Belarus, and I'm aware firsthand of the circumstances, so this issue is very important and concerning to me. But before we jump into discussing the details of the current situation in Belarus, it's important to understand what exactly state-sponsored violence is. Lauren, can you provide a definition and an overview of what state-sponsored violence is? Sure. So I think first we should just think about this idea of violence, and that's been broadly defined to include a range of harms inflicted on people and the environment, um, in addition to harmful acts against our bodies and our bodily integrity. And we can also think about economic inequality, cultural destruction, and community divestment as also forms of violence. Uh, but for our panel, it might be useful to specifically focus on violence as an immediate threat to one's life and physical well-being and livelihood. So what is state-sponsored violence then? Um, sociologist Max Weber describes the state as the only actor within the international community which successfully lays claim to the monopoly of the legitimate physical violence within a given territory. In fact, that's what makes or distinguishes the state from other actors in the international system. And we know that states engage in different types of violence, right? States go to war with each other, or they go to war with non-state actors like insurgencies or guerrilla groups. But a state's involvement in conflict or war may not always be supported by the domestic population or the international community. And we've seen throughout history many times when citizens have engaged in public outcry because of a government's decision to engage in war. But to Max Weber's point, in general, no one disputes the idea that it's the state and its security forces like the military that has the authority to decide when to engage in violence on behalf of its citizens. We also know that states have the capacity to carry out violence against their own citizens. In the United States, we have the death penalty and the largest incarcerated population in the world. And we could argue that those two state institutions are in fact violent. But this is, in the case of Belarus, there are, uh, what's important for us to know is that there are also other forms of violence that can be carried out by the state um, that citizens in other countries do not see as legitimate, and in fact have been prohibited by international law. This includes human rights violations, crimes against humanity, and genocide. So Alexander Lukashenko's reaction to the protests in Belarus um, have, have essentially has been used to be used the state security forces against citizens demonstrating in the streets. Um, and as you mentioned, Daria, right, the, that first week uh, between August 9th and 13th after the election, police arrested around 7,000 people. I think it's up to 10,000 now. Human Rights Watch has interviewed people who have been detained by the state, and they've reported that thousands have been forcibly detained and subjected to torture. Um, that includes being beaten, forced into prolonged stress positions. Uh, people have been subjected to electric shocks, and there have been victims of sexual violence. 
those who have been placed in these detention facilities, they're, they're often overcrowded and incredibly unhygienic, especially um, given the widespread infection rate of COVID-19 in the country. Thank you, Lauren. Tina, can you cite any notable examples of state-sponsored violence that have occurred throughout recent history and how it has influenced the development of the countries and regions in which it occurred? Sure, and I'll take the definition from Lauren. Um, Nazi Germany, I think, is the most obvious example when we think of direct and methodical state-sponsored violence, and it has clearly been identified as such through international law, with a new crime against genocide introduced in international law shortly thereafter. Um, and I want to know it was newly introduced, and this is only in the mid-1950s. Um, so I think that gives you an idea of the historical context of that particular crime. Um, but there are also other crimes against humanity who have since that have since been identified in international law that we saw carried out by Nazi Germany uh, and frankly others in World War II as well. Um, we see the same pattern with another notable example in recent history with the Rwandan genocide. But at the same time, the direct involvement of the Rwandan government in this case in actually carrying out violence is much less clear um, and definitely, definitely less systematic than you observed in the case of Germany and the Holocaust. Um, and I also want to point to another example of state sanctioned violence that's also a little bit less clear. Um, the book titled Torture and State Violence in the United States notes the use of torture as a form of state-sanctioned violence. And in the US, of course, this was um, surrounding uh, the use of torture that came out in 2005. And really this raises the question about treatment of civilians and those deemed to be military combatants in a time of war, also frankly, a time of peace too. Um, but when a state is engaged in violent conflict, as Lauren pointed out, the state is the authority that can carry out violence. That is why we have developed rules for conduct during war. Um, the case of torture as state-sponsored violence raises this issue of whether the state is abiding by the rules, in this case, the conduct of war that we have agreed on or is violating them. And then that violence becomes either unwarranted or unacceptable. This is a tricky case, and this is tricky with lots of examples of state-sponsored violence. Um, on one hand, the state will continuously, as we see with the case of Belarus, but with many other states, um, they frequently point out, we have the authority to do this. We are the ones in charge. We have the military. Um, but on the other hand, um, at what point do, does their behavior go beyond protecting and preserving security and safety? And um, given that I cited a book about torture and state violence in the US, Lauren also noted the use of violence by police. Um, in terms of sort of a regular experience that people might have with state-sponsored violence, it, it is that. Um, the normal interactions that people have with police and military around the world. Um, and I think maybe we'll hear about some of those interactions in regards to Belarus and Russia today. Um, but that, that seems to be the more normal experience people have with that type of state-sponsored violence. And you know that it turns into state-sponsored violence based on the rule of law. So knowing and understanding the boundaries of rule of law um, is important to be able to identify additional examples. So I'll stop there. There, there are countless examples of state-sponsored violence um, in every single region of the world with the death toll as high as 6 million um, with the Holocaust, um, above a million in Cambodia. Um, there are lots of different lists that exist that you can look further into that, but the, but the death toll and the cost of state-sponsored violence is very clearly people's lives. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Mariana, prior to the discussion, you told me that you witnessed an example of state-sponsored violence uh, personally while living in Russia in the early 1990s and going out yourself to the protests that were taking place at that time. Can you tell us about that and discuss the aftermath of the protest and whether they helped defeat the totalitarianism that was in place at that time? Sure. Um, thank you. Yeah, th this is kind of interesting because I was in Moscow in, like, I was the young student in Moscow in 1991 when the coup started. And I think 
as I and later on when I like shortly immigrated several years later to America, and now I'm kind of when I look at the Belarus, I'm kind of wearing like two hats where I fluctuate between recalling the in-person experience, like on the ground that was not mediated by scholarship or kind of media reviews. And then now looking back at that as an artist, when I pick up on kind of cultural undercurrents that surround it and like analyzing the, how the context manifests themselves at the distance between like visual propaganda and the reality. And now like when I would like to talk about it, I want to kind of constantly jump and, and, and talk about how the contexts are constantly fluctuating. For example, like in Moscow, the, the biggest difference would be between Belarus and, and the first coup in Moscow is that in Russia, it resolved itself within three days. So between August 19th, 91 and August 22nd, 91, there was an attempted coup and um, there was kind of a popular uprising. And then by the December 25 of that year, our president had resigned. But like when you, le when you read this little snippet, the historical snippet, I want to kind of unpack a little bit the complexities of all the undercurrents, because I think when we just read the media presentations that concentrates on like what's happening now, sometimes we'll lose insight of like the luggage and the baggage of the Soviet history that exists in Belarus right now and the transition to the democracy in Belarus and in surrounding neighbors. So if you look at the Moscow at that time, what we had is Gorbachev was at the helm of the country. And there's a duality in his identity because on one hand, he was hailed by the Western media as the bringer of democracy and reform into the country. Yet at the same time, he was already a controversial figure for the Russians um, as he was overseeing the, like, the dismemberment of Soviet Union. And I would go as far as to say that if we're looking at the conflict in Chechnya and conflict in Ukraine, and we're looking at the political tensions with Belarus right now, Gorbachev kind of planted the civil war seeds at that time when he was allowing republics to, to disengage with the kind of territorial disputes built in between like Soviet Union territories and pre-Soviet Union and post-Soviet Union and implications with the natural resources and political influence. Um, so he was not entirely like beloved locally. And what was interesting, if you look at the kind of breakdown on Soviet Union and oftentimes, and it was necessary and I'm like staying with the opinion that this democratic shift was absolutely essential, but also we cannot overlook the fact that majority of the people who came to power and ran this new independent republics, new independent autonomous countries are like the members of the communist parties that were very much in charge of the Soviet Union communist um, system. So this institutional switch, because the country had separated itself politically, the, there was kind of really a suspicion towards how authentic the democratic reforms are and whether or not it's a political power grab. So this is kind of the space where the, you know, we find ourselves in Moscow. And as I look at that right now, like into the past through the lens of what's happening in Belarus, I'm thinking these tensions are still very much at play. So Gorbachev is like the iffy president at that time. And if you look at, we, we kind of like Russia had transitioned from we're no longer Soviet Union, there's new treaties, some republics are separating, some um, economic tensions and, and kind of like how far the reforms can go. The country was waking up from like an utter totalitarian regime where questioning the power be was impossible. So as the young students, like for the first time, the youth of that time, we were like, wait, we can criticize things. And all of a sudden politics became hot and interesting. And we're like, we're the youth. We're the ones who are going to rebuild the country. And I find it ironic right now, speaking to you from like United States of America, like I have left the country. And what was interesting, the coup in 91 happened really fast. And unlike today, there was no internet or cell phone connections. So, Person, personal experience was 
is a total like and sudden blackout. There was like no information. We woke up and there was like emergency announcement on TV. All the channels stopped and most of the radio stations were stopped and the newspapers were not delivered. And only a couple of independent radio stations, the most they were allowed, is they would translate kind of the independent musical, like basically the, the authors who sing the songs of protest, they would just channel that on repeat. So like the whole Moscow is freaked out and then you see the tanks rolling down the street. And basically it was kind of interesting moment of with the official channels being blocked, people, when, when I, what I saw and what I find fascinating, like how people are coming together, this idea about the movement from the ground up, how it swells, because right now in the news we see like, oh my God, they're protesting. Right now in Belarus, they have the connections, they have internet, they have access to independent media. They can look at how the world sees themselves as they go through the protest. None of that was available. So we kind of ran to each other, went to school, went to the neighbors, and, and the, like, the rumors started permeating. And then we realized that something really serious is going on. And that's when on um, like the next day, like if you think about like the next two days, this was the spontaneous coming together. That was the first time when at first it was disbelief. They were like, that can't be happening. This sort of thing happened like somewhere in those like capitalist countries. Like what's going on right now? Like, wait, it is really happening. They are taking over the power. The communist generals are connecting with Gorbachev and they are going to overthrow democratic development. We're like, we're not going back to USSR. So this was kind of the reaction where we were like, wait a minute, we gotta do something if it's not us, like what's going to happen? So like the whole uprising was this balance between, I think we're making history. I can't believe it's happening. So when we came to the barricades, this was like really fascinating moment because it was more organized than I anticipated. So when you read in the news, like when you read on the history articles, when you read about it and they're like, well, and the flyers saying that the Yeltsin like is resisting and the information of flyers were distributed, we didn't have Kinkos. So it was not easy to print, like nobody had printers at home. So when we came to barricades and we saw that people are bringing in stuff to barricade with, and actual like water and sandwiches to people who participate and the leaflets were distributed. We were kind of like, this is where it got really weird because on the ground, it was like, was it more organized than we are aware? We thought we just came together spontaneously and like, yay, human being. But at the same time, there's like awareness that there's another organization. So the coup is organized and they have military and the tanks are rolling in and are blocking things in and the soldiers are coming in. And our soldiers at that time, they're coming back from Afghanistan. So we have soldiers who are like my friends and peers were like traumatized soldiers who are going on barricades. And then the young kids who are like our age rolling from the other end. And we're like, but then there's also a well-organized group of people who are like sponsoring that. So like this, this, this way of like state unveiling in front of us was really fascinating. And again, it's like this balance, like, are we doing it? Are we really doing it? And that was the moment where, again, seeing the power of the people was uplifting and very enthusiastic. And it was the moment of unity, the strange kind of wave of positive unity that I see manifest, like the, the visual of people on the streets is similar to what I saw when the mass protests in Belarus were happening that were not the smaller skirmishes where people get beaten and taken away, but there's a moment where so many people went on the street that like most of them marched and they were taken up like on the perimeters. But you can see how like they would carry the flags and it was an overwhelming presence and manifestation of people's voice. So my heart goes out to Belarus right now because again, this is like many weeks endurance run that we did not experience in person in Moscow in 91, and I'll stop at that. Thank you, Mariana. According to the constitution of Belarus, the country is a democracy, but in reality, it's very different. 
Lauren, can you talk a little bit about how Alexander Lukashenko, the current and to date only president of Belarus, rose to power and his style of governing throughout Belarus transition from communism and its independence from the Soviet Union? Sure. So Belarus became an independent country in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. And at the time, there is a, a hopeful euphoria for Belarusian citizens, right? This is an opportunity for the country to form its own national identity, have its own official language. Um, but the problem is, as part of the political transition to democracy, the country moved from a planned economy where the state controls key industries and sets prices for goods and services towards a market-based economy, which includes the privatization of those industries, as well as price fluctuation, because now those goods and services are based on supply and demand. And the result is high inflation, poverty. Uh, for many Belarusian citizens, their quality of life goes down because unemployment skyrockets and their salaries decrease. And so by the time Belarus holds its first election in 1994, Alexander Lukashenko has already devised this sort of two-pronged strategy as part of his political campaign, right? He promises that he will return Belarus to its former Soviet glory and that he will reverse these market-based reforms that have caused a decrease in people's living standards. Uh, and ultimately he wins the election, but as you correctly noted, Daria, that was it, right? There has been no free or fair election since. Um, and so, you know, democracy has, has been a farce. In 1996, he held a very controversial referendum, uh, which allowed him to consolidate his powers and remove term limits. And the way he was able to move from uh, reverse the, basically the market reforms and back to a planned economy uh, is essentially the country's reliance on Russian oil. And in fact, there's a, a term for it, oil for kisses, right? In return for Belarusian loyalty to uh, Russia, Russia in turn um, supplies the uh, Belarus oil, uh, which they can manufacture and sell. And, and that has helped subsidize uh, Lukashenko's uh, state programs, right, and, and the economy. And I won't get too, spend too much time into it, but that relationship started to sour, um, especially in 2014 when Putin annexed uh, the Crimea Peninsula in Ukraine and Lukashenko did not necessarily, was not very vocal in his support because he also wants to curry favor with the European Union, which I'm sure Tina can talk a little bit about. So it's been a balance, right? Um, it, the way he's essentially ruled is uh, he has the financial support of Russia to uh, hold steady the economy, right, up until recently, but, and he uses the security uh, forces to quell dissent. Uh, and then he gives the illusion of free and fair elections when in fact the game is rigged for him to consolidate his rule. Thank you very much, Lauren. I wonder why Belarus is not part of the EU. Tina, can you elaborate on this? Why do you think Belarus didn't join the European Union? And how do you think the EU sees Belarus and its regime? Sure. In short, it does not meet the criteria. Um, the criteria for accession to the EU is very clearly identified. It's called the Copenhagen Criteria. Um, and that was named after the European Council in Copenhagen in 1993, where the criteria to join the EU was identified and published. Um, so it's uh, not a soft legal concept in terms of accession to the EU. It's clearly identified, delineated um, by the European Council. And I'll, I'll name some of the conditions because I think it's worth um, explicitly identifying them to see where Belarus falls short. Um, and I think Lauren's description give, will, will give you a background and be able to do a mini checklist here. Um, so the political criteria are stability of institutions guaranteeing democracy, probably a check minus. Uh, the rule of law, maybe a check. Um, so there is, I mentioned the rule of law earlier, but I do want to distinguish the difference between having good rule of law on the books and then de facto practice. Um, we're familiar with this with our own um, set of civil rights laws in the United States. Um, South Africa has experience with this in terms of having one of 
the best constitutions in terms of rule, rule of law, respecting human rights, yet when it comes to actually carrying them out, that's another question. Um, so whether Belarus gets a check plus for rule of law would be based on whether it's written down or they carry it out. Um, human rights and respect for and protection of minorities is included. And then for economic criteria, a functioning market economy is first and foremost with the capacity to cope with competition and market forces. I think Lauren identified the crux of the issue with the economic systems of frankly, I would venture to say all of the former Soviet republics. That's a tough transition to move from a planned economy to a market-based economy because you are lacking exactly that, the capacity to cope with the instability that comes from having your prime commodity is listed on a market. Um, you just don't have that capacity built and that is not something that a country can build overnight. So the experience of Belarus in that aspect is not unique. Um, and I think that explains a lot of the problems that you see um, even with Russia as well. Mariana already alluded to the fact that Russian democracy did not come to fruition in the way that she and her peers had hoped when they were out there protesting. Um, and I think that there are a lot of other reasons why, but this capacity to cope with the market is a huge reason why Belarus has struggled. Um, the third body of criteria to become an EU state is the administrative and institutional capacity to implement the entire body of EU law. This is known as the EU acqui. Um, forgive me for pronouncing that incorrectly, but um, this term refers to, again, the entire body of law. That's all EU treaties, all EU legislation, international agreements, standards, court verdicts, fundamental rights, um, and all kinds of other principles that are included. Equality and non-discrimination are principles that are in EU law. So this is a high bar for any country to live up to. Um, and I think that uh, Belarus certainly does not have the capacity to implement the entire body of law. You can actually see the relationship of the EU and Belarus take shape really early, um, early as in prior to the current uh, past few years. So I, I will start by saying that recently in February of 2020, the EU prolonged some of its restrictive measures, but those restrictive measures have been in place since 2004. That's 16 years ago. Um, so I think that uh, gives you a sense of this tension um, between the EU and Russia that Belarus has sat in between um, with the EU courting Belarus to some extent. And even that may be a gross over, uh, over characterization of what the EU has done. But they've opened their doors, but they've done so very cautiously. Um, and you see that with, again, 2004 restrictions being put into place. There was an arms embargo that was started in 2011, so that's nine years ago. There's been a ban on the export of goods um, for what, we, what, what I introduced to you earlier, internal repression. So that term internal repression was actually cited by the EU in limiting um, Belarus from exporting certain goods to the EU. And trade bans are a big deal for Belarus because of its trade relationship with the EU and its geographical location. Uh, there was also a travel ban that was introduced in connection with um, some unresolved disappearances of two opposition politicians. Um, there was one business person and one journalist that disappeared. That was in 1999 and 2000. So the EU has shown a track record of responding to the lack of democracy and the um, and suspicions about state sanctioned violence in Belarus really for the last two decades. Um, so I think that that alone describes the position of the EU, if you will, um, and the likelihood of it ever becoming a member. I I'm not sure that's ever been a reality, to be frank, um, but the EU is not willing to close that door either. So, the, and let me be honest, um, they have a good trading relationship. Geographically, they're close. There are reasons why the EU would not want to cut off Belarus completely. And that goes against the principles of the EU as well, but it doesn't mean they want them in the club fully. Um, so having a good relationship is very different than allowing a country into the official club. Um, 
So I, I would say in terms of if it would happen, the potential benefits are really for the people and the drawbacks would be for those in power, including the current president. Um, the drawback of joining the EU would, would be that he would no longer be in power. So it, it, would, it would dismantle the current power structure within the democracy. Um, and it would dismantle the benefits from companies that have enjoyed the benefits um, from having him in power. Um, the truth is when you have someone in power for a long time, that does create a system where there are incentives for non-state actors to continue to support that person in power, whether it's business relationships um, or other types of favors that happen. Call it corruption, call it um, a mercantilist system. But um, I think that's the reality of any state like Belarus. I will cite a couple of uh, statistics in terms of the degree to which the EU has assisted Belarus. I think that's important to understand. Um, they have given over time between 2014 and 2020, so just in the last six years, um, they have assisted Belarus to the tune of 170 million euros. That's 170 million euros. That, that's, not, that's not a huge amount, but it's not insignificant either. Um, and more recently, it had earmarked six, 60 million additional euros specifically for um, assistance for the COVID-19 pandemic. So it has been a good partner. And the EU does provide a lot of information about specific programs. It's um, assisted Belarus with all kinds of um, programs in health, in government, in business, in education. Those are the primary areas where the EU has assisted. So, so it is a good partner, but again, I'll leave it with um, not willing to allow it into the club. I see. Thank you, Tina. Mariana, can you talk about the odd dissonance of the protests in Moscow in 1991 being covered on Russian media and foreign radio and looking back at them many years later? Can you draw some parallels uh, between your experience and the current crisis in Belarus? Yes, this is actually like the best question ever. Because to tell the truth, that dissonance that I experienced then, and I'm looking at that now, informs, like kind of made me the artist who I am. Because the, as an artist, like I am interested in a scholar, like when I do the, the research about migration and issues of globalization, that was the catalyst for me to move away from just like making pretty pictures, which I still can, but to kind of engaging with the principle of, it is utterly fascinating to see how culture is formed before our eyes and then how you can reflect on kind of aftermath. And for me as a visual artist, I'm looking at the formation of mythologies. Like if you think about mythology of the nation state, it's such an abstract concept and seeing like growing up in Soviet Union be like happiest place on earth. And then like seeing it like implode once and then implode again. And then I'm like, yay democracy. And then it's like imploded yet again. And then at that time, what was interesting in 91, the economy was already like shattering. And one of the reasons why I think the coup was coming is because there was a big push coming towards Perhaps the economy was more stable in Soviet Union. Maybe we should move back to that. But the economy was like irreparably shattered. And then what was interesting, several years later, when especially when I moved to America, like several years, we realized like the information came up when in essence, that economic collapse was not connected so much to the inheritance of Soviet Union, which I think all republics are dealing with right now with like the separate like the fact that we're no longer can produce because we broke those connections and the monetary system and dependence on oil. But we realized that the economy in the 90s was sabotaged in order to privatize it at the good price. And it was such an astronomical sense of betrayal that was experienced by the whole country. So like this time distance where you realize looking back that reality is entirely not what you thought it was. And right now when the Putin and oligarch, the system of oligarchs are kind of like solidifying that, I see the mythology emerging again, where even if you look at the popular like soap operas as an indicator, 
the image of the oligarch is changing within the last 10 years from being a corrupt, murderous mafioso, because truly like, that's the only way you can come to power. Either you're communist who inherited the structure or you're mafioso who like made money legally. And then after a couple of generations, I see how like that history is whitewashed. And now the oligarch is this brilliant businessman who had overcome and he owns his money for a good reason. So that system may not be challenged anymore. So when I look at this, like how mythology emerges and how it changes and how like before your eyes, like you see, and then you don't, and then like, do not believe your eyes. So this for me as an artist is like a really ripe place to try to look at how the images move in propaganda and in reality, and then kind of like recoding the culture for political reasons. Like it's interesting to see like how much we do not see because we're not there and how much of that is kind of like the symbolism that fits in the narratives of protest. And another thing that like the dissonance that was jarring for me, and I didn't think that would happen here. When I looked at the visuals, there was a moment where I had several news feeds and the news feed from Portland and the news feed from Belarus were undistinguishable. I could not, like, if you just look at the photos without the context, I could not tell which is which. And that kind of freaked me out. <laughs> because if we're talking about, like, peaceful transfers of power upon election, made me uncomfortable. And this is the moment where, like, the visual, like, as an artist, I react to the visual. And I'm like, visually, as somebody who is alert to the cues that are not coming full words, this was alarming. And, and like, I would leave at that. Very interesting. Thank you, Mariana. Lauren, how is Lukashenko factoring in his relationships with the West, that is the EU and the US, and with the East, namely Putin, in considering his possible responses to the protests? So Lukashenko has always had to balance his relationships with the West and Russia. Um, and that relationship with Putin has become increasingly difficult. So because for the, for the most part, especially the EU, right, um, the, the West has condemned this fraudulent election. Certainly international human rights organizations ha- are trying to do investigations into the types of human rights abuses that have been occurring, um, as well as really, you know, examining the brutal crackdown on these peaceful protesters. Um, the problem is that the more Lukashenko is, alienated by the West, and and rightfully so for what has happened, his only ally then is to turn to Putin, right? Because throughout his reign in power, Lukashenko has always sort of navigated this relationship with the EU and this relationship with Russia so that he, to his people, right? He, it's not that he's a puppet of either, that at times he might come off, um, you know, supporting EU values, Uh, And other times he shows his allegiance to Russia. So now that he's, he's, it's just so clear the violence that has been used and how, I mean, this election in particular, I mean, he said he won 80% of the vote, right? Uh, It's just such a clear rigging of the game. His only ally is Putin and Putin now knows this, right? Um, And Lukashenko needs oil from Russia to keep this economy going. So Russia has pledged, I think, $1.5 billion in aid. Um, Putin has also said that he'll send his security forces in on Lukashenko's behalf to quell the dissent. Um, But this is a little tricky for Lukashenko because if he comes off too loyal to Putin, right, or or that their relationship is really this inseparable or this unbreakable bond, Lukashenko then be, really becomes a puppet, right, for Putin's um, foreign policy agenda in terms of expanding his influence and Russia's influence um, in these former Soviet satellite states, right? And that will further put Lukashenko in a place where he's losing credibility and legitimacy in the eyes of the public. Um, and I think what's also fascinating is that, uh, you know, around the time that the Belarusian protests were broken out, breaking out, there were also protests in eastern Russia because the Kremlin arrested this local governor who is very popular, but sort of an opposition candidate to Putin, right? Or at least a, a potential threat to Putin's reign. 
Um, so they arrested him and we, you know, the, the allegations are that there are false charges, but the point is a lot of people broke out and what the people were chanting in the streets were long live Belarus. So there's this transnational solidarity that's emerging. And I think that, um, you know, to Mariana's point, right, we know that the short term versus the long term, there's often two different stories where even protests that successfully topple these regimes, like in the long run, uh, that, that there's no guarantee for democracy. But I do think that the fact that there are these protests breaking out both in Russia and in Belarus, it places both the Lukashenko and Putin regime and both regimes in a very destabil potentially destabilizing and dangerous situation, right? Um, the fact that both of these leaders have reacted with violence and not even covert, right? I mean, the, the video footage has been absolutely incredible as well as the documentation of, of um, the bruises and, and um, pain that people have experienced after being released from these detention centers. The fact that they've had to be so open uh, about the violence, uh, you know, in my opinion is when violence is the last tool that a government has in its toolkit, right, to retain its power, it's in a very fragile position. I don't necessarily think, that, okay, there's going to be a collapse in the regimes in the next two months. You know, it's, it's very difficult to forecast that. But when you have to use violence to compel your population into submission, you know, typically those in power, I mean, they're, they're very scared and they're vulnerable. Uh, because they can't just do it with propaganda. They can't just do it with, you know, social welfare programs or, you know, um, you know, paying people off for their votes. So it, it'll be interesting to see. I agree. Thank you, Lauren. Tina, what is the EU's position? Are there plans to impose any sanctions or have they already been imposed? How effective would sanctions be in convincing Lukashenko to step down? What else can the EU do? So just today, and today is September 24th, uh, if you're watching a recording later. So just today on the 24th, um, the EU officially announced that Lukashenko is not the legitimate president of Belarus. Um, their press statement was titled Belarus Declaration by the High Representative on behalf of the EU on the so-called inauguration of Alexander Lukashenko. So they are using in an official press statement, um, the word so-called to describe the inauguration. Um, they also quote uh, that the elections were neither free nor fair. So they're actually calling for new elections basically um, that would be under the supervision of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. Um, that's a mouthful. So um, that that would be under super under um, so ad external supervision. So having some sort of election monitoring that that's typical in order for a democracy to demonstrate um, that elections are free and fair, and that's typical of new democracies as well to need that type of external monitoring. So that monitoring serves a very important function. Um, so the EU also said at the end of the statement in a pretty vague term, they were reviewing its relations with the country. Um, so lots of news outlets have been reporting what this could mean, um, but basically it could mean sanctions, it could mean stopping direct funding. I already gave you some of the statistics on the direct funding. Um, so in the last um, 16 years, they have given over 170 million euros. Um, and then the COVID assistance is at risk as well. Um, but it could also um, stop going through the state and simply funnel its assistance to non-state actors or actors even that are in the state, but below the central state. Um, so that, that's pretty common as well for aid agencies, whether it's a country's aid agency like USAID or USAID or a non-profit, or sorry, a non-government aid organization. Um, so this is a frequent problem that aid agencies have, right? How do you give effective aid to a state that's behaving like Belarus is right now? Um, so you, you try to go to where the aid is needed most by giving directly to healthcare systems, whether it's direct aid to a particular set of hospitals um, or to other organizations working within the government. Um, that's not 100% uh, of an effective solution either, but it's a good alternative. Um, I'm not sure what else the EU can do short of that. 
um, other than the sanctions that they've used in the past in terms of limiting trade. So exports matter a lot. Um, trade is a common sanction because that can hurt a country pretty quickly and it can convince a leader to do something other than use violence against its own people. Uh, but as Lauren noted, with Lukashenko's back against the wall, essentially, um, there's not much space for him, I think, right now to absorb any sanctions. So I think that sanctions right now, coupled with the timing of protests, would actually be more effective than they have been in the past. Um, so the EU sanctions in the past, um, clearly, they did nothing to stop what's happening right now. Um, but uh, again, the whole the whole benefit of sanctions is that it's added pressure. It's not a end all be all solution, but but it would complement the pressure that is being put on the state not just by protesters, but by other countries as well. Um, and I, I'll talk a little in a little bit about the pressure coming from other states, including the United States. Um, but the EU has been pretty clear. And I think that other states have fallen in line with the EU story of rejecting the election, calling for new ones, and calling him an illegitimate president. Thank you. One more thing, Dario, just to build on Tina's point, Lukashenko has completely denied that COVID-19 exists right? He, it, it just doesn't. Drink some vodka, you'll be fine, right? Um, so the idea that these sanctions, like I, I think that's even more in regards to these, the effectiveness of these sanctions, that if aid is withdrawn, it's going to put the population in further disparate positions because right now it's been civil society that has been leading the way in terms of public health campaigns, helping provide PPE for doctors and nurses. Um, so all of the functions we typically would expect a state to provide in the middle of a public health crisis, people have had to rely completely on civil society. And so I think that there's an added context here that further um, leads to, to, to Tina. I, I think Tina is absolutely right in terms of what, what could, um, the effectiveness of, of uh, the EU strategy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comment, Lauren. Mariana, can you compare the way the media in Russia, Belarus, and the United States is reporting on the protests? This is fascinating because as kind of somebody who studies propaganda, for me, this is, I, I make my students do that when I teach the art and globalization course, to look at the different countries. And like I watch the conservative and liberal and, and see like how truth hovers somewhere in between when the spin becomes magnified. It's fascinating, and to follow up on my colleagues' uh, points, what's really interesting, like when you think about how Lukashenko denied the existence of COVID, if you look at his um, statements during the inauguration, this is where it becomes like, that's why I think liberal arts are so important, because when you start looking at the language and you teach students how to write and read, like you can pick up on those, because it's like, I cannot abandon my Belarusians at the time on the brink of the global crisis. So like, there's a moment where I cannot have no right to abandon Belarusians. And he just acknowledged like the crisis exists and he knew it. And only now he's like, I'm the only one who can help you. So this kind of political posturing again, like in my opinion, reveals the troops by trying really hard to con conceal it in a way. And so when I was watching the media, as I watched the media, there's like several sources. So I watch, what I find interesting when I watch Belarusian news and I see how it's covered, the more independent ones, they post the news with kind of a commentary. For example, like I read um, about the inauguration, um, the opposition politician, Pavel Latushko posted like, where are the jubilant citizens? Where are the diplomatic corps? It is even obvious that Alexander Lukashenko is exclusively the president of Oman, the right police, and a handful of line officials. So there's a moment where they present the facts and then there's a commentary. And then when I look at the more kind of centralized Belarusian news, that was really interesting because at first you read and they kind of denote the moments and kind of like the facts that are happening. But when you start unpacking the language, like there's protesters, but there's like legitimizing identification of the police officers. So if you unpack the language, like the protesters, like they're always 
just the cho choice of words kind of creates the questioning of whether or not, like they're the ones who go against the order. And the police officers are like the rule of law, like the representative state. And even by the sheer fact that instead of explaining kind of the human aspect of that, they just give us the fact, after a while it becomes pretty blatant because you realize that they kind of try to create a neutral or like objective stance, but by ignoring the fact that it's like a horrible humanitarian crisis and you're like beating your own citizens. By not mentioning that at all, like the, like the concealment becomes even more visible. What I find fascinating, for example, and, and this is like the news, like uh, RIA news, they're factual, but again, like the violence is presented as a chess game without like human contest. So you read that and it's like, well, this happened and that happened and this happened and that happened. No, this is that. And then for example, um, the Belarusian um, news, Navini, um, it was interesting because again, they're starting to present, like if you look at the Lukashenko, pro-Lukashenko news, is always spun, like the relationship of Putin is spun in an interesting way because they're not saying we are going to be dependent on the dictator that's like right around the corner. They're saying, have you noticed how NATO moved the tanks and our arsenal pretty close to our borders? And Poland is about to gobble up one of our territories. So you can see how they're tapping into kind of the cultural coding that exists um, from the Cold War. And then for the younger ones, it's also like you can see how they're hitting on the national identity. And this is the fascinating, if you look at the Belarusian protests right now, the exaggerated national identity is happening on both sides right now. So if you look at Lukashenko, they're saying like the, the narratives are that NATO is coming to um, take the power away. And then you look at the opposition, they're saying like, if Putin rolls the tanks in, then whatever happened in Ukraine will be happening here. And both sides present the narrative for like, we need to preserve Belarus and, and we need to preserve Belarus as like its own culture. Like we, we need to save Belarus because it's about to be like dissolved by NATO or Putin. And what was interesting when I look at the Moscow news, this was even more interesting because Russia, like the more official ones, when you look at the photographs, they're like the, Belo, the news of the Belarus are not even on the front page. So when you go down, like most of these images will be a meeting of Putin and Lukashenko. So the, or Lukashenko like being sworn, the inauguration images. So when you look at the Russian news, well, I, I agree that they're kind of like nervous right now about the fact that if they present the images of the protest in Belarus, that might even further inspire the Russian uh, citizens because like it's an unstable country right now. So all the images are like quoting to legitimize Lukashenko, like just the visually. So if you just scroll it before you even read the headlines, like he's being legitimized. And then when you read the language, it's basically Lukashenko and Putin working towards um, rebuffing the advancements of NATO that is breaking the law and kind of like moving the weaponry close to the borders. So you, it's, it's kind of fascinating. And like BBC is presenting, like BBC is a fascinating like entity that are sitting on the side, but I always go to them to kind of see another angle in the news and um, they're echoing that Putin welcome Lukashenko, that the economic connections are important, that the Moscow is the big brother, so the quote in Russian news, and at the same time kind of acknowledging that disgruntled Russians shouldn't get any ideas and that's kind of the aim of Putin's work. But if you look at Voice of America, um, they're going to, like they're presenting the fact that Minsk, Minsk and Moscow together right now are launching a pretty considerable campaign 
talking that all the protests are created by USA and uh, European Union. So that, and, and again, like it's tapping into this insecurity that is several decades long, like the generational insecurity where like what you think is happening might not be happening. So they're like, oh no, no, you see those protests, it's all fake. So it's like uh, Americans are coming. And, and again, like in Russia, the anti-American propaganda is absolutely um, ever present. So like they're, they're moving into the same narrative where all the protests are paid for and the people are provoked or duped into doing the bidding of the enemies of Belarus. It's scary because it's effective and it's fascinating for me to kind of analyze the cultural structures. Uh, very interesting examples, a great comparison. Thank you, Mariana. There are three women leading the opposition movement in Belarus. One of them is Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who ran for presidency after her husband, who himself was running for president, was put in prison. Tikhanovska joined forces with fellow opposition candidates Maria Kolesnikova and Veronika Tsikala to take on Lukashenko in the election. Tikhanovska and Tsikala left Belarus in the immediate aftermath of the election due to fear for their personal safety. Kolesnikova, however, stayed and spoke out against the results in the regime. In the beginning of September, she was kidnapped, and on Tuesday, September 8, she was detained at the Belarusian Ukrainian border after what her representative said was an attempt by the authorities to forcibly deport her. Kolesnikova had to tear up her own passport at the border with Ukraine to avoid deportation. She has since been in custody in a detention center near Minsk, according to her press secretary. Also, it's very interesting that there is a chance that Belarus's second president will be a woman. Quite a radical change, especially compared to America, which has never had a female president. Lauren, can you comment on that? So I want to talk a little bit about uh, Svetlana Sikhanovskaya because, uh, as, as you mentioned, Daria, she, she ran on her husband's behalf. And so one of the tactics that Lukashenko would invoke in order to rig the election would he he would arrest uh, opposition candidates or simply not permit them to run. So why did he allow um, the wife of this popular blogger to run? Basically, he didn't see her as a threat, right? Uh, this was a housewife. You know, there's no way that she would have any sort of a legitimacy or credibility in the eyes of the public. And so he completely underestimated her simply because she's a woman. And in fact, he even gave a speech where he says, our constitution is not meant for a female leader. <laughs> so you can unpack that, right? Because there's a lot <laughs> in that sentence. Um, so it's sort of interesting about how Lukashenko perceives women and uh, the reality we have the most important leaders of the opposition um, be women. So what do we know about like trends in terms of women participation in these protests, right? Uh, Erica Chenoweth and Zoe Marks have found that as many as 70% of nonviolent campaigns um, from 2010 to 2014 included moderate or extensive numbers of women in, on the front lines. And we know that nonviolent protest movements, right? When I say nonviolent, it's not that there isn't any violence, but it's that it doesn't come from the protesters, right? The state might inflict the violence. Um, but when protesters commit to nonviolence, they tend to be more successful. And they tend to be more successful because they're bringing in broader coalitions of people. And we've seen that in Belarus, right? Um, you know, segments of the society that are, you know, might be apolitical or not really engaged, they are coming out to the front lines uh, in massive numbers to support pro democracy reforms. And so, you know, there, there are some really, there's some really interesting research that the more women are involved in these campaigns, the more likely they are to be nonviolent. The more they're nonviolent, the more likely they are to be successful in at least achieving their goals or ousting the leader. Um, now, in the case of the United States, uh, no, we've never had a woman president and, um, you know, <laughs> So there's a lot to unpack there, right? Women leadership in the United States and government is, is actually pretty appalling compared to other countries. Um, but I think what we do know, right, more than ever now, uh, is that black women and women of color 
uh, are typically the ones who have been leading this country and making sure that the government is held accountable to its democratic principles and its commitment to equality and human rights. Um, and, and when we think about it, right, it's usually the people who have been most marginalized and disenfranchised from the political system who are leading the way for a country to fulfill its uh, ideal, ideals, right, its, its democratic principles. Um, so in the end, you know, it's always a great sign of progress when women are elected to positions of power, especially within the government. Uh, it's also important that we do not underestimate or write out the ones who are actually, you know, taking to the streets to demand change now. Right. Thank you, Lauren. Tina, what has the reaction or lack thereof of U.S. been? Is there anything America should be doing to improve the situation for the people of Belarus? So that's seemingly a simple question, but the answer is a little bit more complex. And it's complex because of the current leadership of the U.S. president um, and his relationship or lack thereof with the Department of State specifically. Um, so interestingly, when um, you search for mentions of Belarus on our current president's Twitter feed, um, there are no direct tweets about it. Um, and that, that's important because that, that is the tool that our current president is using to speak to the American people, but also to convey the agenda. Um, frankly, it's been the only tool, right? So I, I think that says something, but maybe more importantly, this is what says something even louder, that while the State Department, and I'll get into what the State Department's been doing in a moment, um, the short answer is a lot, but the United States under Trump, so Trump said that he was going to nominate the first U.S. ambassador to Belarus in over a decade. Um, so this was back in April that he intended to nominate career diplomat Julie Fisher from the State Department. Um, she was already a State Department official, so this was um, not as clearly a political appointee, but that she would be nominated for this position. But the truth is the United States recalled its last ambassador back in 2008 when the president then, Lukashenko, um, or, ordered a reduction in the staff of US diplomats. So the United States has long been aware of the patterns of abusive power of Lukashenko by pulling its ambassador in 2008. And then by introducing a new ambassador um, I think that that shows the degree to which our president is at odds with his own State Department. Because when you start to look at the State Department's reaction, um, it's actually very clear and very strong along the lines of the EU. So uh, just in the last couple of days, um, the United States recognized that the United States, along with other participating members of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, um, took the step of invoking what's called the Moscow mechanism to establish a mission to look into credible reports of human rights abuses and um, not just violations of election fraud, but other violations as well. Um, they say unequivocally that they stand with like-minded, and I'll quote, allies and partners. They call the August 9th election fraudulent. Um, they also say that they repeatedly condemn the actions of uh, the Belarusian authorities as they continue to violently crack down on peaceful protesters. And again, I'm quoting directly from our State Department news release um, that was issued on September 18th. On September 17th, the State Department issued a joint statement on the internet shutdowns in Belarus. So um, noting that the freedom of expression, big cornerstone in democracy that's being taken away and violated um, by Lukashenko and others in the government. So the joint statement was issued by the United States and uh, over a dozen of other developed states and they clearly identify the fraudulent presidential elections in their joint statement. Um, they actually cite specifically shutdowns and blocking or filtering of services um, in order to limit rights of peaceful assembly and freedoms of association and expression. They're, they're using language that is very precise and very strong, and they are posting it publicly on the Department of State website. Yet that message is not coming out of the White House. Um, so I, I think that in this particular case, you, you can see that there's some tension, and I think that it's pretty clear where that tension lies. And you see that with Trump, 
um, and his rhetoric towards Putin, right? Um, where it's been very friendly, oddly friendly, um, a little strange at times, but, but it's pretty clear that a relationship exists in a way that has not for former presidents, right? Um, in my own opinion, I would say there's an admiration there, right? I've read similar opinions from other political scientists that um, our own president in the United States has an admiration of Putin. And does that extend to Lukashenko? I, I don't know, because he has not been saying as much. Um, but given the relationship of Belarus to Russia and then EU, I think that that potentially points to um, the reason why the voice of the president is missing on this case in particular. I also wanted to note that the State Department called out the abduction that you were just describing. On September 8th, it released a press release um, that opposed. So the State Department's gone on record as opposing or for opposing what happened as abduction. They use the language abduction of opposition leaders in Belarus. Um, and they cite, again, the case that you were just describing. So it's mixed, right? Um, I'll also say USAID reports um, uh, efforts of the United States to support Belarus financially. I did want to note, I think it's important to note that the US has supported Belarus only economically through USAID. Uh, the US is a big supporter militarily of states throughout the world. Um, but in Belarus in particular, it's been 100% economic, at least the funds through USAID. And um, it has come to the tune of $133 million between 2004, 2020. That doesn't match the assistance from the EU at 170 European million dollars. It's pretty close though, especially once you control for the difference in currency over the same time period. So financially, the United States has been a supporter and it's actually dispersed a lot of its um, intended commitments to Belarus, which, which is not always the case with a lot of American partners. So USAID is working in partnership with Belarus, again, while the White House remains silent. What should the United States do? Um, it should continue to do what it's doing through the State Department. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I would advise if advice from out from elsewhere was welcome at the White House by anyone, to be honest, um, that that would be the advice to stick up to the words coming out of the State Department and to amplify the voices out of the State Department in a way that demonstrates greater leadership and clearly condemns what is happening in Belarus not posting press releases on a State Department website and then having the President of the United States go silent on the issue. Um, that conveys its own message that it's not at the top of the US agenda. And I think that others around the world, including Lukashenko, are going to interpret it that way. Thank you. Thank you for this information, Tina. Um, may really quickly add, I just wanted to add something about like the, the woman as a leader I, I just wanted to throw in a little tiny kind of historical fallback on the role of women, because coming from Soviet Union, when I just came to America, like the role of the feminists kind of like were surprising for me. And I think when we're talking about the misogyny in Belarus, and, and by the way, like there were some women who were detained and they're reported between the beatings that were told you should have stayed at home and cooked dinner. Now you're getting what's coming for you. But during the Soviet Union, there was a moment where like the role of the woman, and if we talk about the like, traditional equality and the pay equality, in a weird way, they had achieved it because everybody worked and it didn't matter whether you're man or a woman, you just like get paid. You know, mind you, the government will take away your children and educate them and brainwash them in the kindergartens. They were free, but like it's propaganda. So it's always double-edged sword. But when, and this is where it's kind of weird, the role of the housewife in America versus the role of the housewife is in Eastern Europe after the collapse of Soviet Union is dual because on one hand, the right not to work was a democratic moment. So like becoming a housewife is a dual thing. On one hand, we can see, and I think after several years of embracing that, women realize that it creates like the role of dependency and takes away a certain amount of autonomy. But initially, like the Soviet statement, like those who don't work don't deserve to eat, 
and the role of the housewife would be associated with like bourgeoisie capitalist thing that we successfully had dismantled. So it was like weirdly politicized. So now when we look at the kind of like how we, what women have to battle in the Belarus, it's like really layered and complicated. Because at first it was democratic, then they were like, no, we're doing it, it's not. <laughs> Let's like tap into the fourth wave of feminism that happens in West again, because like now we're on the same level with the battle. Thank you for this, Mariana. Thousands of students skipped the start of the school year on Tuesday, September 1st to join the ongoing protests over the disputed election, some of whom were detained by the police. Mariana, can you weigh in on the student protests that have been taking place in support of Belarus? Yes, so I have mentioned kind of like the mood and how the youth stepped into the protests already, but I want to like mention there's like two interesting aspects. Like first, thousands of students did skip like the first start of the school year in, Berlo in Belarus on September 1st. They like joined the protests and they were detained by the police. And what was interesting, again, students and the youth were always the first on the barricades. And they're like, again, it's like participation and making of your own country and ability to stand up for injustice. It's like mythological proportions. It's up sweeping. And I think we see to a certain degree, the uh, same tendencies in the United States, so we can relate to that. But what was interesting is like columns of students marched along the Independence Avenue and gathered in Victory Square. And then the teachers, for example, like the Art Academy, the Academy of the Arts, teachers and students formed the protest. However, like there are moments where some teachers, and I think I'm, I'm looking like the, um, the teachers in the Ming State Linguistic University, their professor who threatened to call the riot police because students were protesting. And the, there's a warning that went out right now, schools and universities are warning parents who attend protests that if they have little children at home, they could be seized under 2008 laws on dysfunctional families. So kind of the role of youth and children right now is like coming forth um, and magnified. But um, another thing that I want you to think is the, the fact that students joined into the protest is also kind of going counter to the education system in Belarus, because there's like the conflict in there. And that happens with the, the authoritarian regime and the need for that regime to prop itself on the propaganda, which inevitably filters into the universities. So students right now exist in that space where you receive like one information in the university, you get graded on that, but everybody reads between the lines. And in a certain way, it's similar to how I recall being educated in Soviet Union. So when you kind of like have an automatic pro propaganda filter, so the students and, and the students who join the protests, they're avidly consuming kind of Western media and Russian media, like the, the, the conflicts that I mentioned in the media before, like you can trust that the youth of Belarus right now are very well aware of this like inherent contradictions. So when they're stepping into the political arena, they're extremely informed. And they are going, like, there's a moment where, like, not only they're protesting incredible injustice and violation of the human rights, and they're still optimistic about the possibilities of the future for their country. At the same time, they are, like, really ready to put their voice into, like, let's dismantle the educational system because they're really acutely aware of, like, how the propaganda had permeated the you know, educational narratives and, and how much it serves. So it's, it's fascinating to see. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing like what scholars will come out of this generation and their ability to critically self-reflect because visual art as a discipline, as a scholarship has this fascinating history of kind of coded in ability of critically self-reflect and kind of consider many angles and not trust like anything. Everything is up for question and you have to realize like, this is a postmodern moment where the reader determines the meaning to a certain degree and you have to like sort through your prejudice and propaganda. And I think youth 
of the students in Belarus right now, they're like living that. So the scholarship that will emerge later is going to be awesome. And there's like art that I can already see, like the visual art and the music and performance art that is beginning to blossom. And that sphere is like great. It's too bad we don't get to see it because like art does not make front page often. But um, I'm like, I think when the images and iconography of the protest will subside, we will see like youth leadership emerging in Belarus. Thank you, Mariana. And my last question is for everyone. What happens next? What do you think the possible outcomes of the protests? Does Lukashenko give up or does his iron rule continue for the foreseeable future? The magic crystal ball question, right? <laughs> Um, you know, I think that his position is a little different, maybe, than other leaders who we've seen um, face the same exact predicament. His predicament's not new, right? Trying to hang on to power um, while also currying favor with those who support the economy. The economy is important. Um, so as he continues to try to curry favor with the EU to the degree to which they at least will maintain a trading relationship with him, um, I think that maybe he's crossed that line. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I suspect that he rolls back a little bit. There's nowhere to go. Um, he's, he's kind of boxed in at this point. Um, he, he could have rolled back <laughs> and over the last couple of years, but I think that that time is over. I think that window of opportunity has ended. So I, I, I don't think he's going to willingly go though, to be honest. I don't think he's going to be willing to open up what is being called for fair and free elections, um, continuing to centralize power and perhaps turning to more authoritarianism to do so because that's what's required to continue to hang on to that power. Um, and that's gonna require more intervention into the economy and, and sort of pushing towards more authoritarianism and a state controlled economy. Um, I, I suspect that that is a more likely or more probable outcome. I'd be surprised if he gave up power. I, I completely agree with everything Tina said. And just to, I, I guess, to add on it, if we're going to, you know, think about possible questions to consider, um, Putin just went through this very con controversial referendum um, where, again, it, it wasn't free or fair, right? There definitely there were ballots that were stuffed. Um, but the point is, it allow among other provisions, it keeps him in power until 2036. And uh, even though he had this referendum, his popularity has waned quite a, quite a bit. And so I think that's also another factor to consider, right? Um, the more Putin loses legitimacy uh, within his own country, uh, you know, I, I'm curious as to what kind of effect that might have on his allies in the region and their reliance on him. So that's something else to consider. I would agree with Tina. There's something that you mentioned about the fact that there's a conflict between like what would be feasible and reasonable from a political standpoint versus like the weird personality that this man has. And we have to take both in account. And I think he's stubborn and he like will not go willingly, but the Putin's presence, when I was reading some of the independent, preparing for that, I was kind of reviewing some of the independent uh, Russian news sites. And there is like, if you look at the language and how like the language of official statements shifts, there's like, people are entertaining the possibility that Putin might strike a deal with Lukashenko to like, let him go without too much criminal persecution and you can keep your stolen money, but like, <laughs> let go of the power and you can find refuge in like basically kind of political afterwards, like escape route. So there's a possibility, I think Putin could facilitate that like graceful exit that would allow him, if not save the face, kind of like pageantry of inauguration would be preserved with the like elegant, while all the way screaming that, oh my God, those Americans forced us and we will persevere. But I'm worried about the economic upheaval that follows up. The, and, and that would kind of squash the dreams of this generation that just came together as a country. <laughs> 
I'm kind of like really worried that what will happen is like if you look at Russia right now and you wonder like how could Putin come to power and hold it so tightly? Yeltsin had presented like after the events of 91, country had completely disintegrated its control and people were so hungry for any semblance of order that they were willing to forgive Putin's like transgressions and actually embrace it and be like, well, we're different than them Westerners. We're good with the czar. And I wonder, and I'm worried that unless EU will step in like in the greater like political assistance and like if, if we leave Belarus as is and kind of like do lip service to their democratic development, they might come up with another dictator. And I think the country might kind of like really kind of become a token in kind of external politics of the region, whether we we'll toss it around tr like trying to appease. And I'm worried because globally right now there's like this enigmatic dictators who provide a false sense of stability keep emerging. Like look at Poland, it's completely mind blowing. So there is a moment where I'm kind of like weary of this beautiful moment if, and, and the celebration of victory that will follow because I think Lukashenko's days are counted. But like th give it three years, it's going to be like the Belarus would actually need our help more than ever then. Thank you very much to all of you for taking part in this important conversation. I hope our viewers will find the discussion informative and of value to them. Thanks again.